I'm next in the broadcast. Preparations continue on the day before Pope Francis's visit to Korea, which begins Thursday and will include a presidential visit and a consolation mass for the families of the victims of the ferry disaster. Legislative deadlock in the National Assembly over whether to give prosecution powers to an investigative panel into April's ferry sinking is leading to a halt in critical economy-related bills as well. And with the markets buzzing over tomorrow's anticipated rate cut by the Bank of Korea and the government's new measures to boost the service sector, we go further in-depth on the latest snapshot of the Korean economy. Primetime News begins now. Stay with us. Welcome to Primetime News Live from Seoul. I'm Sean Lim. And I'm Kang Tae. Thanks for joining us tonight. Tomorrow morning, Pope Francis uh, will be uh, landing in Korea to be greeted by South Korean President uh, Park Geun-hye at the Seoul Air Base to kick off his first trip to Asia as a pontiff. And it will be the first papal visit to Korea in 25 years. Here's our Hwang Jae with a rundown of the Pope's trip. Pope Francis won't be wasting any time upon his arrival in Korea on Thursday morning. After a short welcoming ceremony, he will head to the presidential office and meet President Park Geun-hye. On Friday, the Pope will head to Daejeon to lead a mass at the city's World Cup stadium. There, he will console bereaved families and victims of April's Sewolho ferry disaster. On Saturday morning, the Pope will visit Sosomun Martyr's Shrine, where the largest number of Catholics were executed in the 19th century. After paying respect at the shrine, he will parade through Gwanghamun Square to beatify 124 Korean martyrs. Beatification is a declaration by the Pope as the head of the church that the deceased faithfully lived a holy life and are now dwelling in heaven. And it's no coincidence that the ceremony is taking place in the heart of Seoul, where the Justice Ministry was located around 200 years ago. The Pope starts from where the martyrs lived, their final moments, and goes back to where they were declared sinners to beatify them. He is correcting the past and trying to heal the history of the persecution of Catholics. On Sunday, he will lead a concluding mass for the 6th Asian Youth Day at Hemi Fortress, located in the nation's southwest region. Around 2,000 young Catholics from 23 different Asian countries and some 4,000 young Korean Catholics will take part. On the morning of his last day in Korea, the Pope will hold a mass for peace and reconciliation at Seoul's Myeongdong Cathedral. Many expect the Pope to convey a message of hope and healing to those who are poor and marginalized, as his visit also includes meeting with the victims of Japan's wartime sexual slavery, laid off workers from Korea's Sangyong Motor, and a trip to a rehabilitation center called Kotongne. The Pope will fly back to Rome next Monday afternoon. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Korea's two main rival parties are still haggling over a special bill that's supposed to get to the bottom of what caused the April ferry disaster and who is to blame for it. Our National Assembly correspondent Chi Myung Gil says prospects for a quick resolution are not looking bright. Rival parties are wrangling over whether to give an inquiry panel prosecutorial powers during its investigation into the Seoro ferry disaster. The opposition party and the families of the victims are insisting they be given that authority, arguing that the panel will not be able to root out the causes without it. With the ferry bill in limbo, a number of other bills related to stimulating the economy are pending. I'm speechless. What are we getting out of this political deadlock? What's the essence of democracy? What are we going to say to our future generations? Our party has been trying to offer leadership to the parliament. I've tried to break the impasse and have done my best to cooperate. 
The government is trying to speed up its drive to boost the economy with a set of stimulus measures, including tax code revisions that are intended to induce money to flow from businesses to households in the form of investment, salary hikes and dividend payouts. President Park Geun-hye is known to have instructed her aides to cooperate with parliament to ensure the passage of a set of bills aimed at rooting out corruption and fostering service sector industries to create jobs. But with the rival parties at loggerheads, the new economic team may have no choice but to wait. If the political discord continues, the ruling party may find it much more difficult to pass urgent bills, while the opposition party could be facing yet another leadership crisis. Kim young Arirang News. Today, the presidential office of Chong Wa Dae released a book on the Park Geun-hye administration's national security policies, and this comes on the heels of Seoul's unexpected proposal for high-level talks with Pyongyang. Our Hwang Sung-hee has more. South Korea offered up more carrots to North Korea on Wednesday, saying the two Koreas could discuss the establishment of a so-called peace regime when the time is right. In a book outlining President Park Geun-hye's national security policies, the Presidential National Security Office stressed the need for inter-Korean military dialogue to build trust and reduce the chances of potential clashes. The so-called peace regime is widely being viewed as a potential peace treaty to replace the armistice accord that brought fighting in the Korean War to a halt. That would work in North Korea's favor, which has repeatedly claimed that a peace treaty was necessary for ending what it called U.S. hostilities and for the ultimate denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. South Korea said, however, Pyongyang must take responsible steps for its torpedo attack on the South Korean warship Chunan in 2010 and the shelling of a South Korean border island in 2011. Also outlined in the book is South Korea's willingness to gradually open up inter-Korean trade and to allow commercial investment for various economic cooperation projects. In other words, Seoul hinted at a readiness to ease economic sanctions on the North depending on Pyongyang's change in attitude. This comes two days after South Korea made a surprise proposal to North Korea to hold high-level talks next week. A response has yet to be given, but for now, the ball remains in North Korea's court over shifting the tone on the Korean peninsula. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. The need for cultural reform within Korea's military has been underscored yet again. Just this week, three soldiers have committed suicide. Our Shin Se-min reports on this tragic trend and the military's response. An Army private first class previously identified as a soldier who required extra attention committed suicide by shooting himself in the head during a live fire exercise on Tuesday. One day earlier, two Army corporals were found dead together in an apartment suicide while on furlough. Both were also classified as soldiers who needed extra supervision as they had exhibited suicidal tendencies in personality testing. In their suicide notes, the two, whose names are being withheld from the media, said they had been abused in their barracks, with one of them writing he even wanted to kill one of his superiors. These are the latest in a series of tragedies involving enlisted soldiers in recent weeks, all after experiencing physical and mental abuse, often at the hands of their seniors. According to the military data, over 820 soldiers have taken their own lives since 2004. 47 of those cases have taken place this year. The Defense Ministry and new Army Chief Kim Yo han have vowed to address the problem and reform military culture. They've promised a renewed focus on counseling and programs on suicide prevention and anti-bullying. But they'll need to fund their efforts. Of the military's budget of 34 billion U.S. dollars this year, just $123,000 went toward educating Korea's 600,000 troops through the types of programs and courses dedicated to preventing tragedies like these from occurring. Shin Se-min, Arirang News.
Now, I want to talk about two economic data points out this morning of the number of new jobs rebounding in July after actually dropping for the previous four straight months. And home transactions nearly doubled this past month as well. But we need to really ask ourselves if these are signs of significant recovery. Right. And to help us with that conversation, Professor Shin Se Don from the Sungmyung Women's University is joining us here in the studio. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. So, what did you think about these numbers out this morning that point to a more positive economic signal for the economy? Is it just a blip, or do you think there's really underlying factors here now? Those two figures are really a few of good signs that you can find these days because major. Macroeconomic data has been showing very significant downfall in the second quarter. Okay, so we need to uh, wait for, I guess, next month's figure or this month's figure actually to figure out whether it's a right. trend. And I recently read your column okay. on um, commenting on uh, Finance Minister Choi Kyung Hwan's mm -hmm. uh, policy package, and you're not a big fan. Why is that? Well, I just criticize, you know, a general direction. In the sense that, you know, previous team had a pretty um, rosy economic outlook. Mm -hmm. In the sense that, you know, they believe the economy is beginning to pick up since the end of last year. But all of a sudden, you know, after the Seoul Ferry disaster, you know, all the economic data shows quite contrary, mm -hmm. and the, the president changed the team, and, and now everybody is expecting very dramatic policy measures. Mm -hmm. And I understand, you know, the new team has to make the economy really, really going by showing the actual results. And that's why, you know, the older measures, the first measure in uh, late July and the third measure in the, the service industry, all the, you know, major policies are geared to investment in infrastructure. Right. Right. So if you look at the fiscal expansion policy measures, you know, the uh, July, you know, a uh, tremendous amount of you know money was directed to the building houses, building streets, building highways, and in the in the, in the service you know industry uh, uh, measures you know uh, came out a, lot, a couple of days ago. All, you know about 77 percent of the money also directed into building resorts mm -hmm. like uh, casinos, right. hotels, right? So you're saying that a lot of these uh, proposals that look like their service proposals or look like their proposals to boost up exports uh, were just construction. Projects in in in, in guys, right? Hardware, yeah. hardware. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what would it really take in terms of like shifting more of the investment? Can it be done really by a government-led investment? Those hardware um, scenarios can be really tangible with the government support, but in the software area, is there a limit to what the government can do? Right. Exactly. You know, the previous government, so not this government, but the government before, they had conducted a similar, you know, they had implemented a similar kind of process, uh, uh, policies like uh, building highways, you know, building dams, you know, as you know, the full Grand Four River project, something like that. So all the measures were directed to building infrastructure, and that's very easy. And, and the direct results will come in a Few quarters, right? So that is the attractiveness, the attractiveness of the measures. But but those kind of you know hardware investment policies, uh, of course, very direct and effective. But but in the long run, right, mm -hmm. the effects will be disappeared in, mm -hmm. in a couple of years, right? Okay. And uh, going back to uh, pumping money into this economy, mm -hmm. uh, the Bank of Korea is expected to um, widely expected to cut this time, and right. I guess at 25 basis points. Right. Do you think it would be enough? From the history of the Bank of Korea, right, mm -hmm. um, there has been a number of cases, at least five or six times, you know, the, the bank lower the rate, but in, in almost every case, you know, the, the, the rate cut was more than a quarter percentage, mm -hmm. sometimes 1.5 percent, sometimes, you know, 0.5 percent. So I think, you know, a quarter percentage point may not be enough, but if the bank lowered the rate mm -hmm. half a per percentage point, that's going to be another shock, you exactly. know, to, to, to the economy. So I think if the bank lower uh, this time, would be, would be a quarter, uh, but uh, maybe they need to do it one more time, probably down the, down the road, maybe next month or month after that. All right, okay. Professor Shin, thank you so much for your time and insight tonight. Thank you.
And picking up on the last point of a widely expected rate cut by the Bank of Korea tomorrow, uh, if that happens, it will be the first such move in 15 months, as suggesting the central bank's policies are in line with the finance ministry's efforts to stimulate the Korean economy. Our Sun Jung In has more. Among economists is a widely held belief that the Bank of Korea will cut its benchmark interest rate at Thursday's Monetary Policy Committee. Now the focus is on by how much. Reflecting the expectations, the yield on three-year government debt has slid over the last couple of months, inching closer to the key interest rate. According to polls, 8 out of 10 financial experts estimate that a cut of 0.25 percentage points would push the benchmark Kospi index up by 60 to 70 points. If the government and the central bank fail to cooperate on lowering the interest rate, the effects of new policy measures to boost the economy may be in vain in the short term. Pundits speculate that central bank Governor Lee Ji-yeol gave the signal to cut the rate at the policy meeting last month. However, there are concerns that a rate cut may not be as effective as many anticipate and that it won't help to address swelling household debt, which has now surpassed one trillion U.S. dollars. A lower interest rate causes an increase in household debt, so a rate cut may help the economy in the short term. But there are potential risk factors that could lead to more household debt in the future. That puts the Bank of Korea in a tough spot. Another rate freeze will almost certainly trigger criticism over not working in step with market policy, while an interest rate cut without offering clear reasoning may mean lost trust from the public over the abrupt decision. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Web cartoons have found a home in Korea. The growth of this industry over the past 10 years has been nothing short of incredible. Our Park Ji-won tells us about their rise and what the future may hold for this market. 35-year-old artist Kim Pung publishes a weekly webtoon on a major portal website in Korea. He often accesses his own work through his smartphone and checks the responses of viewers, something that keeps him connected to an industry he's very much invested in. I see a great potential in the industry. Nowadays, public perception about webtoons has improved greatly, and we see many cases of webtoons being adapted into different genres of art or becoming the source of other products. I see the future of webtoons in a rosy light. Since debuting in 2003, Kim has witnessed the growth of the webtoon industry in Korea. Back then, we didn't even have the word webtoon. We called them internet cartoons. It was an infancy period. The history of web cartoons in Korea dates back about 10 years now. Back in late 1990s and early 2000s, so-called internet cartoons were mainly composed of personal anecdotes or were short comic strips. The web to market began growing in 2003 when Taum, a major Korean portal website, started to provide webtoon portal services. Naver, another major portal site, jumped in in 2005, triggering a webtoon boom here. Webtoons then began delving into all sorts of genres like action and thrillers and began to involve more serious, large-scale plots. By 2010, Webtoons began a source of story banks for other genres. Nearly 50 webtoons produced in 2012 and some 40 webtoons produced last year have been adapted into films, dramas and even character licensing contracts. As of 2014, webtoons began providing translated contents to the global market through a diverse set of platforms, such as Naver's global instant messenger program Line, to meet a wider audience outside of Korea. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. The United States has sent an additional 130 mili military personnel to Iraq to help contain the threat from hardline Islamic State militants. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul Washington has already approved U.S. airstrikes to aid Iraqi security forces. What's this latest military team hoping to accomplish? 
Well, U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel, who recommended the operation, said they will solely act as military advisors, clearly stating they will not engage in combat. The group of 130 Marines and Special Operation members arrived in the city of Erbil on Tuesday. Their mission will be to help assess the humanitarian situation in the northern Kurdish region. This as tens of thousands of Iraqi Yazidis are still said to be trapped on Mount Sinjar in desperate need of food, water and shelter. Meanwhile, in Baghdad, a suicide bomber attacked a checkpoint near the home of the newly appointed Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi. According to local media, there has been so far no reports of casualties. Fans around the world are still reeling from the sudden death of legendary actor and comedian Robin Williams as further details emerge on his apparent suicide. Preliminary results of a forensic examination released on Tuesday showed Williams likely ended his life by hanging himself. Police say the 63-year-old was discovered by a personal assistant at his California home Monday local time in a seated position with a belt around his neck. The investigation is ongoing. Toxicology testing will be conducted to determine if uh, any chemical substances were in Mr. Williams' system at the time of his death. Williams was known to have struggled with substance abuse throughout his career. Representatives said he had been battling severe depression as of late and was seeking treatment. And turning now to the latest in Japan, the country's economy has suffered a major setback after experiencing its worst decline in three years. GDP data released on Wednesday showed the world's third largest economy shrank 6.8 percent in the second quarter. This despite Tokyo's recent fiscal stimulus package. Economists say the shortfall is due largely to a rate hike in the nation's sales tax, which hampered consumer spending. The Bank of Japan's communication to the market to, to, to uh, make, uh, do, make good on its commitment to reflate the economy, I think is a much more important issue right now than these third arrow um, reform issues, um, which Abe is trying to you know, get through the government. Economic Minister Akira Amari says Japan can still make a comeback, calling on investors to look at the overall direction of the economy rather than reactionary fluctuations in the market. And that wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Welcome to sports. Starting off with the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup in Toronto. North Korea played against Team Canada, their last Group A opponent. But lost a match, giving up a 65-minute goal by Janine Becky. North Korea finished the group matches with a 2-1 record. Despite the loss, the team finished first in their grouping. On goal differentials, uh, North Korea will next play the United States on Saturday in the quarterfinals. Sticking to football, this time over to men. Hopes to temporarily transfer Sunung Min for the Asian Games in Incheon have failed. The Korea Football Association asked Bayard Leverkusen in writing to release Son for the upcoming Asian Games, but got a reply saying that they could not. Since the match is not officially on FIFA's agenda, and as Son is crucially needed to help out the team, Korea has to go without the ace and is scheduled to submit their 20 man roster on Thursday. Now over to Wednesday's KBO action between the Nexon Heroes and the Lotte Giants in Busan. Starting the pitching game, Andy Van Hecken for the Nexon Heroes and Hong Sung Bum for the Lotte Giants. Lotte gets on board quick in the bottom of the first, hitting two doubles for two runs. Nexon returns the favor in the second with a couple of doubles and singles to rack up five runs, making the score five to two. Lotte not giving up yet. His two doubles to run, for, to run in for two. Trailing by one in the bottom of the second, five to four. Nexon has a couple more runs to take the game, eight to five. Checking out other games, NC beats Kia in a coin toss match, four to three. SK wins against Lotte at eight to five. Success on the ice has translated into numerous big paydays for Kim Yoon Ah. Forbes on Wednesday ranked the figure skater the fourth richest uh, female athlete in the world. Kim reportedly earned $16.3 million over the one-year period starting in June last year, much of it as a celebrity endorser of products. 
She was a top paid athlete outside the world of tennis, with Maria Sharapova, Lena, and Serena Williams topping the list. That wraps it up. This has been Kim Young Bin. Always stay tuned to updates from the world of sports. Good evening, I'm Michelle Park here with the latest weather forecast. A light drizzle is falling over parts of the central region and here in Seoul, a fine dust advisory is, is, is expected to go in effect anytime soon. Now tomorrow, similar overcast conditions are expected nationwide, while heavy rainfalls over the southern regions lasting until Friday. Now due to the wet and cloudy weather, we can expect cooler daytime temperatures with the highs hovering over into the high 20s. Now showers will clear up to a mild conditions on Saturday, just in time for the beatification ceremony at Kwang Plaza. Now going over to our temperature readings. Seoul will top out the Thursday morning at 22 before reaching up to 27 in the afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Daegu and Busan will top out to 24 and 25 degrees. Now moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops over to 26, while Tokyo hits 23 and Mount Kungang tops into the mid-20s. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and back to you guys. That's primetime news on this Wednesday. I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Kang Tae Enjoy your evening. We'll see you soon.